the Azerbaijan Industrial Security Red Team Operations. It basically joins two different parts that I really like and I'm really fascinated with. And one part is industrial security because it kind of just combines or lets us see how IT security just interacts with the physical security world or with the physical world and we just see the impact of IT security quite easily. And the second is Red Team Operations and this is basically the heart of what we do since the beginning of our company. So we really just like to do uh, penetration testing to do security assessments, technical ones, and uh, do this in order to help companies to protect against attacks. I could have done this in a couple of different ways the presentation, and one would have been uh, to kind of explain to you uh, sort of how we perform um, penetration tests in industrial sectors. I chose not to do exactly uh, this presentation this way because I thought probably there are not so many people working in power plants and there's probably also not so many security consultants who perform penetration tests. So what I thought, what I would like to do is to present you a couple of the texts that we use usually in our attacks. So you can go back probably to your own company also and refer to those and say like, are we probably vulnerable as well and what to do against those. So present a couple of attacks, we discuss also measures against those and this is what I want to do today. So basically, um, what we do with the company is really technical security assessments. We don't do any ISO 27001 assessments, we don't do security management, we really just focus on the technical side. Though from the technical perspective, we just have quite a wide, a wide uh, range of topics that we cover. So typical, yeah, I would say web application penetration tests, or internal network security tests, we do on a daily basis. However, you also do a lot of uh, tests performing in the industrial sector. And we're really, really uh, happy to have really cool clients that are either producing uh, SCADA software in, for critical infrastructure or also operate their things. So we really get a lot of nice feedback from different areas and can combine those experiences. What we also do is we do perform social engineering and physical security tests. Social engineering on one side, on the IT side, meaning IT phishing attacks, for example. But on the physical side, you really try to break into a company physically as well. Um, if, if you look at physical security penetration tests, they're not so common. You can imagine it as a, an IT penetration test just for a building, for example. So instead of doing a port scan, you walk around the building and look at all the entry possibilities and eventually at one point you're going to break into either from the roof or from the back entrance or whatever you find a vulnerability in. And if you put all those together, you come to one term called Tiger Team Assessments. Um, in this combination, we like to use the word Tiger Team Assessment, while often you also read it as a Red Team Assessment. Although I think Tiger Team is really more specific to kind of, you know, those different parts, like social engineering, IT, and physical security, working together, while this red team is a more general approach in saying like testing security systems in comparison to the blue team defending them. A typical Tiger team assessment approach would be that a company will come and ask, we are developing, for example, products for the future. We kind of have a research department 20 years against 20 years into the future, and we don't want this information to leak. So can you probably go to us, break in, and see how easy it is, or if it is possible even to steal this data? And then we would mix up all those components. So for example, we would try to get a sales meeting during the day, and to try to get access to the company physically. Uh, often those research um, areas are on a separate network, so you wouldn't cannot directly access from the internet. So you need to go there physically. And once we're in the company, we either just already plan the device, or you could also, for example, wait until the evening, let's say like one in the morning, after everybody leaves, and then just go to one of the offices, use tactics like uh, lock picking, for example, to break into the office, and then use a laptop to hack the computers that are inside, steal the data, get out, and eventually, of course, write the report with all the vulnerabilities you identified to be able to fix those. That's the essential idea behind all of this. So, 
And that being said, so IT security uh, until uh, physical security, if you combine those, there are very different ways to attack a company. And, uh, and which way you're used really depends on a couple of different factors. One of those is the actual target asset. So if you, for example, want to steal credit card information, you probably rather go on the IT side of, of attacking things because it's less risk for the attacker and credit card data most often is stored in digital way anyway. Well, as if a company from the industry building comes and asks, we have for a production facility, we have a recipe, and uh, that recipe is stored in our PLCs on our computers in a production facility, and it's on a separate network, then you have to kind of combine it with a physical attack vector. So this attack part you choose is dependent on the target asset but also on the resources and the time frame you have. So in the beginning, you define what kind of attacker I'm up against. And then, for example, if a company says, I just want to protect myself against people walking by, and say, like, hey, there is an open door. I'll just try to get in. It's a very different approach also in securing your company than if you want to secure against a state-sponsored attacker, for example, who might even wait a year or two years until we can break in for time is no, uh, no issue. One part is company culture. So, uh, for example, we most of the time, once you get physical access to a company, you can just try to walk into the company or by whatever means. But once you're inside, you're a trusted person. Um, sometimes you can grab like another code that you can use and once there's a company logo on it, it's huge. most of the time you're really trusted. Some companies do have a different culture as well. So some companies they have really close groups that are working together uh, and do know each other very well. And in those cases, it can be that they come up to you and question you. And so if this is happening, you probably might choose a different attack rate as well. And of course, the implementation of the security concept meaning um, if you, for example, have a very tight physical security perspective and you have to go there physically, you will not attack the alarm system. We had one example where we had to break into a financial sector institution and they had um, a, a wall of, how do you say, alarm wall, laser walls and, and additional alarm systems and such. Then, of course, it's kind of really difficult to attack physically alone. This time, we, for example, use social engineering to get in. So depending on all of these factors, you have kind of different tech approaches. And uh, one really nice example, um, it's a bit older, but I like it because it really combines these different areas, is an example from an attack on a pipeline in Turkey in 2008. Uh, was there in 2010 because an article was published 2010 with information about it. Um, so there was an explosion of the pipeline. and. At first instance, when you look at it, they have centralized monitoring system measuring pressure and throughput. And they also had different communication partners, wireless or satellite, in case one of those breaks down. So it all sounds quite feasible. Though still, although they had all of this in place, it took them 40 minutes after the explosion until they identified that it was a problem. And it was not due to the alarms, but because they saw the smoke. I've got this out of the uh, official uh, official newspapers. So um, I'm also not sure if everything is 100% correct, but this is what I read officially as well. Um, they use cameras as an entry point to the network. Well, I don't know if it's now cameras over the internet, attack over the internet, and then go further into the enterprise network, or if they were there physically. Uh, in either way, it shows the combination of like a physical topic actually taking, uh, yeah, having impact on the IT enterprise network as well. They got, the, uh, got access to the network, compromised Windows machines that installed malware backdoors, and from there on moved on to the SCADA networks, to, con to the control networks. And it was one interesting fact in addition was that all the surveillance data from all the cameras was deleted. So there was no information left, no videos to watch. And then later on, they found out that there was a part of physical tech as well. And these were guys going with laptops somewhere to the place where the explosion happened. 
And the only thing they knew this was because they later on discovered that there was a small camera that was not connected to the rest of the network. It was just a simple, simple camera. And that still hold information or video footage from that day. So you see, this combination of those areas can have a really big impact. And that's why it's so important to kind of cover all those aspects together from a security perspective. We have here a simple network from the industry. So we have here an HMI, a human machine interface, where you can see what's happening in your uh, network. You have PLCs, so the program of the logic controllers, so, uh, where you read data from sensors or can control some parts uh, of your production facility. You have one or more workstations, operating workstations in the network, and of course, a physical component. So if we do a security assessment, uh, we've talked about most of those. So we also first define the attack itself, so we know what we want to secure against. Um, then we perform a risk analysis covering all those different areas so you can put them all together to know where to start and where the biggest risks lie in. Uh, what we usually do is we calculate the different attack paths uh, based on uh, also on the, on the probability of attack and ease of attack. And we then try to verify this practically as well. Take the first three or first five. Uh, we do this in order to also confirm ourselves that the risks we put on there or the probability that that is correct would be estimated. And then, in the end, we identify measures to reduce those risks. So, let's have a look at the different scenarios. The first and most obvious one is IT hacking. So, in this scenario, physical security wouldn't play such a big, such a big role. Um, one example where it was really relying on just an IT-based attacks was the power of the genome cream. Um, do you know this one? Have you heard of it? Uh, it was uh, on the 23rd of December 2015. In general, there were 30 transformer stations that uh, went down, went to blackout, and uh, three different transmission companies were affected and targeted by this attack. Um, in general, it was 225,000 people without power, I think over a couple of hours, but the exact time frame I can't recall. So, what happened? The beginning of the attack was a typical spear phishing attack. So, you kind of put together an IC mail and sent this email to a couple of those uh, companies waiting for one employee to click and to start uh, the connection. And once they did that, they finally had a waiting period and they got access to one of those stations inside the company. From there on, we kind of uh, wanted to go directly to the SCADA control network. However, this was not possible in this instance. Um, that's not always the case from our experiences. We often see that those networks are combined. Luckily, in this situation, this was not the case. So they had a firewall in between. They were monitoring, um, monitoring on the tour, but they, they, had, they had those separated. So they couldn't go directly. What they did is they jumped from one host to another within the normal IT network and waited until they got the right access credentials to move on somewhere to the SCADA network. Um, just for you to get an idea, this kind of was in a time frame from, I think, half a year to a year, where they could already be within the network and had the time of jumping from host to another and were never detected. So after this time frame, they had access credential from a technician who led uh, with uh, VPN access uh, to the SCADA network. And within the SCADA network, they then got access to really the SCADA systems. Also here, they were in a rush. They just took the time. They found out which kind of uh, systems they were running. They were programming also the firmware, especially for those devices, so that they could reprogram those devices. And afterwards, they kind of really, at one specific point in time, made the shutdown. They also did a denial of service attack on the, uh, on the help desk service in order, now for customers not being able to reach them, but I think also for the energy companies, so they do not get such quick a hold on, on where the power outage exactly is. And such. Um, this is just one example of, of the, uh, the email they used. It was a black energy malware. It's kind of a one that's developed already for a couple of years. It develops through it all the time. And uh, if you enable macros in Excel, then you can execute code. 
So, IT phishing is really a topic that comes along in the last couple of years and it rises and rises again. And, and uh, in the industrial sector, we also have more than in the enterprise sector, more the issue as well that we have more systems directly connected to, to, to the internet uh, for remote access, like done in modems or remote desktop servers. And um, one of these examples was pulled by Kaspersky, I think, in June 2016. And there was a website who published a list of compromised RGP servers. It was 72,000 of those servers online, and you could buy your access to one of those servers. Um, as you see, I, I, I pulled on this information as well. It's from a German news web website. The, just for you to see, in Germany, there was were 1,300 servers affected, and out of those 1,300, 450 led to access with the point of sale software. So it's not just probably not just a normal enterprise network, but it could potentially also be even more into scale the security systems as well. So um, the website looked very simple. You could have see the IP address that you want to uh, compromise. You had the price and probably what's installed on those systems as well. And it was really a long list of different servers you could choose from. Site so is taken down, so you can't buy anything anymore. All right, so we've covered the IT area, and I just want to move on to social engineering and physical security. So we're basically attacking the network from the outside, from a physical perspective. We want to walk into the company. Typical vulnerabilities that you come across are, for example, doors that are closed but not locked. So you don't, op don't operate uh, the bolt, but you only operate the latch above. Um, we have an installation of insecure locks or wrong installation of locks, but we also kind of take, attack the video surveillance or alarm systems. And before it goes too theoretical, I brought a couple of videos, uh, demo videos and examples as well. So if we look at door locks, for example, one thing that we see quite often is that I have to move my here. One thing that we see is protruding locks. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So locks that uh, are two, three, four millimeters longer than they actually door. And what you see is here from one of our classes um, is uh, he just uses one of those uh, devices, <laughs> device, but, uh, and breaks the lock. And that was it, basically. So you see how easy it is to break such a lock. What this student is doing, he's removing all the small parts, which is not actually necessary. It's just so we can use the door again. But if you if you just broke off the lock, you can just use a normal simple screwdriver or one of those plastic keys to open the door. And that's it. Um, I showed this to you just to kind of, for you to get an awareness of how fast it can be to break such a lock and why it is important that you install secure dress plates, for example, and keys that are not reduced. Another example is um, locks or doors that are not locked, but just closed. Um, we see here on the left side, this is an electronic system, the card system, and usually with those card systems, you're just operating the latch and not the actual bolt. So you could use a credit card, as you see from the movies as well, to just open the door. And here you see this part is operated, while this part is not. And that's kind of really an easy attack. And uh, the more electronic systems we have, the more uh, this issue is forgotten about, I have the feeling. So kind of it's quite easy within a company to go from one office to another to get access. What you can do, I guess, is to install here um, for example, an, an automatic lock system that really operates the bolt every time you uh, operate your electronic system. So let's see where we are. Oh yeah, alarm systems. Uh, we said we had, uh, for example, operation of a door. So you could argument, okay, I'm operating, you probably can open the door, but I still have an alarm system in place. 
And they may be right, but you also have to look at the installation of your alarm system, how good it is, how well it is installed, like with everything else. And uh, I have one demonstration on this topic, or one video that I want to show you. And uh, it uh, doesn't depend on the, on the vendor, so you can just close your eyes. And, um, but what we do here is we have a look at those alarm systems. And um, for example, a lot of those systems coming from the physical security world, they don't incorporate all the things we've learned in IT security already. And it's quite difficult sometimes. So they, what they use is often, no, they don't use encryption for their own communication. And what we do here is basically we just record some data that is being sent when you operate, for example, the remote control for deactivating your alarm system, and then just replay it. So you just wait in the morning until somebody comes deactivating it. So we see it here, probably. Um, we have here remote control. He's deactivating the alarm in the morning, and we see here a little spike. And this spike is basically the data that is transmitted. And the only thing we do is basically we record this information, then store data, and then next what you're going to see is he's activating the alarm here, and here it starts to be a countdown to 10, 9. And now going to the left, just put in play, and the countdown will stop. And that's it. So it's just by replaying that information that I had before, uh, you can deactivate the alarm. Um, there's not just one vendor, but also probably other ones that, vendors that are affected as well. But what's important is that you look as critically as you, on your physical components as you do with your IT security components. Video surveillance. We had the topic before, for sure. Um, if you are in a network, and you have access to a video camera somewhere in between. Let's get back to our description with the door. So we have a door, we can open it. There is an alarm being raised. You probably might have it. Uh, you can watch it on the video camera. Well, we've set up here. We thought, OK, then let's have a look at video cameras as well. And how could we fool them? And uh, one of those topics, or one of the setups is here. Uh, we have a video camera installed. It's filming basically in the background the entrance of, of the office. Uh, we have here the video camera feed, so you can see what the camera sees. And what we did beforehand for this demo is we installed a small device. It's grams a Raspberry Pi, also here. Um, it's, it's quite simple. It's small, and you can install it quite easily when you're physically inside. So it's kind of the same attack approach. So we just take the data, we record the data, and replay the data. So it's not, not something that's really complicated to do so. So you'll see me going out of the office. You see those on the camera here. And what we're going to do then is we have this device installed between the camera and the rest of the network. Um, you can really easily do this. Um, often there is no alarm being raised because hackers can get lost in an IP network. So. And what we do here is we analyze the video stream. We kind of take some samples of the video stream out and we replay that back to the camera. You see it here with a short flashing. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And you see me walking in again, but you don't see anything on the video camera. And so it's quite easy also to fool those. Although, also here, if you install a video surveillance system, um, you have possibilities to protect against. If you do use encryption, if you do use, for example, a VPN system, you can't perform man in the middle attack so easily, then this would be a measure against this. <coughs> so. If all of those uh, uh, fails for you as an attacker, you probably want to go a different route, and you can also attack authentication uh, directly. What we did is uh, also nothing special. My fear is broken, for example, for longer. So the only thing what we did is we put this on a mobile phone device. We wrote an app for that. So you would just go somewhere to somebody, hold your mobile phone to his access card, copy his access card, copy it to a different, usually Chinese access card, because you can reprogram that more easily. 
and then have a copy of his access card. And you do something like privilege escalation on a physical basis from one office to another. Uh, I'll skip the demo for this because uh, I want to have the focus on one different last demo and I think we should then come to an end. So if you have um, all of this put together, you look at a combined attack as we talked before. And this combined attack is like, for example, physically going in, planting an IT security device, and then hacking from the outside. What we usually do is we take photos of important documents, we copy access cards with our program that, that I just explained, or we try to secure access to the network. And examples of how you do that is you can use one of those devices, for example. You, you can use a rogue access point that you place, you connect to the network, and so if people come there and want to connect to the network, they connect to this one. We're moving, giving the data forward, we're moving it to the network so they don't know that they are in our wrong access point, but we just uh, um, collect all usernames and passwords, for example, that I use. Another, another gadget would be a mini computer. You can use any of the mini computers you can find on the internet to reprogram those, or you can just put them somewhere into the network, put a cable on there, and uh, in this case, also UMTS stick, for example, so you can connect outside over the uh, internet and to some guy sitting in the office, and he's then from the office attacking the network from the inside, just as another possibility. When it comes uh, to industrial sector, you basically do the same uh, as, as, long as in the other examples. Uh, I've just one last one last demo or presentation. Let's see if this works out. <coughs> All right, this looks good. So in our setup, we have one PLC that's kind of this device that takes um, that reads information from sensors and sends it to the operator or takes control of all or whatever. Um, we set this to listen, so it's opening a port. And on the other hand, we need the operator to kind of operate this device. And we'll, be, see, we'll see it here. Okay. And it's, for example, just a normal lock, uh, wall for whatever you want to imagine. And we set this, for example, to the value of 12. And you see the system is operating with a value of 12, whatever, probably opening 12%. Um, if you look at this, we also see here in a register zero, the value of 12. So it really corresponds and they talk to each other. If you would be on site, on a network operating basis or on the network there, you could launch different attacks. And a very simple one is, for this case, is performing man-in-the-middle attacks, as we had it before with Crane. Um, you perform man-in-the-middle attacks very easily with uh, using, for example, Etikup, which is saying perform man-in-the-middle attack between those two systems, our presenter, and when we want to have a look at the network communication. We might see the packets as well. <coughs> oh, the trick. So the packets coming in. Um, there's different protocols that are being used, and you have to just get used to all the protocols uh, and the proprietary protocols in the industry. Then, um, one example we are using here is uh, Multiple's protocol, and as you can see down here, this is a request, and it's asking for uh, the value that's stored in the first register, register zero, as we saw before, and it's answering with a response. And it says register zero has a value of 12, exactly the value that we said before. And you can learn about these protocols and develop different attack techniques to every one of those. I want to close this window. A 
if you apply, for example, a very simple program for Ethica, the simple program just takes the bytes that are transferred. You have to learn the communication pattern. We will not go there into detail. But the only thing you have to read here is we replace in every request that is being sent the value of 11 to the value of 255. FF. And we replace in every response 255 with 11. That's it. So if you mount this attack again with this filter that you wrote, it should kind of exchange just the values that we just uh, presented. We have here a value of 12. Let's check if it's still working. So we have a value of 16. It shows 16. When we check it here, we also have a 16 here. So this works. We said we exchanged the value of 11. So if you put in here 11, it changes here. It says it's 11. And if it works, in the back end, it's 255. And you can imagine the impact that this kind of very, very simple attack might have. The operator is just seeing something very, very completely differently than actually what the vault or whatever part of the uh, industrial fan is doing. So the question is, we watched a lot of different attack methods and vectors, we mentioned also a couple of different possibilities how to defend against those. Um, in general, or generally speaking, um, my recommendation is integrate all your different security domains into your risk assessment, in the, into your risk management. It's really important to look at every different aspect because of the reasons we saw. Um, it also helps you to use your security budget that's always quite limited, uh, to use it very efficiently because you know your, your risks in different areas, basically. Um, and one really important last point is, I think you really have to take care that you employ use monitoring, and not just monitor, but also react on alarms that you've got. It doesn't make sense just to collect everything, but you also have to be able to react on it. Because we will get compromised one early or later, and this is the only thing that's going to help you then. You should then have an incident response in place, because most of the time when companies are then getting compromised, they lack a little bit of data on what really has happened, and the second is they don't know who to call. And usually either you have an internal team, or you have a good partner that you can call, and he will help you through the rest as well, and help you to set it up. But so this is really important, and of course, continues to improve as all the attack vectors continue to change as well. So, thank you very much from my point of view. I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed it. <laughs>